welcome to the Think MHK podcast presented by the Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce. On this podcast, you will hear about a variety of local matters pertaining to the business community. You also hear from local business owners to hear their story and gain valuable business insights. Thanks for tuning in today. My co-host for this segment is Charlotte Meisenheimer. Hey, Charlotte. Hey, Jason. You have a special guest for us today, right? I do. I'm super excited about today's um, segment. So I am so thrilled to have Kylie Moody with us today. And Kylie serves as the Leadership Manhattan Board Chair. So welcome, Kylie. Thanks for being with us today. Hi, Charlotte and Jason. Thank you both for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. So Kylie, tell us a little about what you do and then what was that pathway um, to being the board chair? Um, I work at Kansas State University and have worked there for several years in a couple of different capacities. And a few years ago, I took a job change that was still affiliated with K-State, but worked in economic development, which allowed me the opportunity to apply for Leadership Manhattan. And I was fortunate enough to be selected. I was part of Leadership Manhattan class of 2017. Really enjoyed the program, people that I met, (laughs) and everything I learned. And there was an opportunity as a class member to be nominated by your class to be able to serve on the board. And so I was lucky to be nominated by my peers and then was able to serve on the board. Really enjoyed that, getting to kind of shape the curriculum and really think about what should that curriculum look like? What should Leadership Manhattan focus on? And then um, as a result of that involvement was asked to be the chair. And I said, absolutely, because the people have been great to work with and just an opportunity to continue to be involved. And so I'm really excited to serve in this role. If I don't know anything about Leadership Manhattan, what would you say? I would say that it is a great opportunity to learn more about the Manhattan community, to learn more about the businesses that make up this community, and also an opportunity to learn more and maybe even to be made aware of the different issues and challenges that are facing our community. And then how can you be involved and be part of helping make progress? How can you be part of helping to educate and bring awareness to these issues and these challenges? And I think also, why is it so critical? critically important to support our local businesses and our local economy. And then also, of course, the added um, benefit of getting to meet a whole whole lot of new people, getting to network, make connections. Because the program has been in existence for several years, the opportunity to network and connect with alumni has been awesome as well. You again, you get to meet new people, learn about businesses too that are new or that you may not have heard of before, or just, again, different opportunities within the community to get connected and to be involved. So as you mentioned, you were in the 2017 class. So other than sort of the standard experiences that everyone gets, was what was unique about your personal experience? I think a better understanding, for example, of taxes and where that money goes and that it may seem like a lot. But then when you really start to parse it out and learn about all of the the different areas and the ways that it supports our infrastructure and just supports the community, then it's kind of like, oh, like we need more, you know, or like, what does that look like? How what are other funding sources? So I think that was the biggest eye opener for me. I think when you don't really fully understand or, again, may only know kind of the surface level, your perception is a little bit different or may even be a little bit off. And so I think that was my biggest learning opportunity. And then, too, I am someone who I do. I do not see leadership as a formal position or having a formal title. And so I think that it really opened your eyes to all of the ways that you can be involved and you can make a difference without, again, having a formal position or title. So what do you think as somebody you so having gone through it as you talk to people, misperception about the program? in the community, if there is one. I think um, our board talks about this a lot and we've continued to try to like shout this from the rooftop, but you do not have to be nominated to apply. And so there is that misconception that, well, if my employer or if someone I know didn't nominate me, I cannot apply. And that is not true. You can have someone nominate you, but you can also take that initiative and apply yourself. And so either way is great. Talk a minute about the application process. And and I know We're probably full for for this year, but maybe for somebody that's interested, 
uh, for the next class. T- walk through that process and what someone can expect as part of the application name, address, general information, and then um, it will ask about your education background and then um, employer. And then there are a few open-ended questions. And so again, an opportunity for um, the applicant to get to share a little bit more about their interest in being part of Leadership Manhattan. Also um, kind of thinking about the future of Manhattan and what excites them. And then to also list um, their community and civic engagement. And again, that's another area. If Because I remember when I went to apply, I was like, oh my goodness, like I'm not very involved in the community and, you know, will that hinder me? And it does not because again, a lot of people and we see Leadership Manhattan as kind of a springboard to involvement too. And so don't let that also be a reason that you would not apply and think outside the box too. You know, there are church organizations or there may be committees or other things that you are on as part of your role. And so that all fits in really well too. And then um, a couple of other just general um questions, again, to just get a better understanding of why there is an interest. And then um, there potentially could be an interview process as well. Um, Again, just an opportunity for the board to get to know applicants a little bit better. And that process is an independent board and group that evaluates who's selected, correct? Yes, that is correct. So it's not not the chamber board. It's not the chamber staff. It's No. And the selection committee does not get any identifying information. So it's completely blind. So... We do not know identifying information to be like, oh, I know Sharla, like, woohoo, go Sharla. Like, we do not get any of that information. Right up until the interview process that that day of, Mm -hmm. in fact, you don't see any of that information. So it really is a blind way to just look and score those applications. And that's different than when you were in, right? So, yes, that is new. And again, um, just an opportunity to kind of get to know people a little bit better and also Some people, their strength is more written communication, but for other people, um, more verbal communication. So it just provides an opportunity, too, for people to be able to talk and expand a little bit more in both ways. So you talked a little bit about the board and and how you're able to help shape the curriculum. Um, You want to talk a little bit about how that's even changed? I mean, recently we added um, a a whole nother session. So now we have seven sessions and that's relatively new. So do you want to talk a little bit how that curriculum has changed a little bit? Um, I know we have a lot of alumni that may not be aware of some of the new things we're doing. One thing is I think we start off with kind of learning a little bit about the individual. And so we focus a lot on strengths or strengths finder, which is an assessment that everyone takes and it gives them their top five strengths. So really focusing on asset based leadership and approaches and what do you already bring to the table. And then from there, we move into a little bit more about the community issues and challenges and learning more about that, but then also how the class together um, can work together. And so the class will normally choose a project. So there are different nonprofit organizations that will submit a request for proposal. And then um, with a project and then the class together will decide which project or projects depending on the year and the class interest that they want to partake in and help with. And so that has been a new addition that I think has been really well received, not only by the class, but also the nonprofit organizations as well. So that has been new. We've also tried to be very timely and really pay attention to what is going on in the community. So last year with COVID and everything going on, we were able to hear from the committee of local doctors and healthcare representatives that were helping kind of make decisions and know what to do and those things. And I think that was very interesting and engaging for the class to learn about. Um, We've also added more about education, which I think has been really eye-opening. If you do not have, um, you know, a child or any connection to the school system, system, learning more about some of the challenges that they face. That has been, again, very eye-opening. We've also added in more about um, poverty and kind of the socioeconomic differences in, in the community because that is also sometimes invisible and depending on your work may not be aware of it. And so we've really tried to be very intentional with the programming and also provided the class members an opportunity to try out different things. So when we do reflections, we do those in a different way. When we have facilitators come, they may lead that session differently. And then our hope is that the class members can take some of those things back to their businesses or their organizations and try out what may work for them. And so 
I think all of those have been um, well received and different. But we also really focus on meeting the class members where they are and will continue to make tweaks throughout too. Or if something comes up a couple years ago, it was the big box. Big, uh, dark um, store theory. Dark store theory. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. I knew I was going to get that wrong. No, but that's right. Yeah. So again, I really like that, that we are flexible enough to be able to bring in some of those issues that, again, depending on what your line of work is, you may be like, I had no idea. I didn't know what that was or that it existed. And so I think that that, again, um, is a really important component of Leadership Manhattan. So what benefits do you think the program has for the community at large? Oh, my goodness. I think, again, just the awareness that it brings for people, the opportunity, I think, too, to educate other people and to help people understand how important local decisions are, I think is is critical as well. I think sometimes, you know, we can get you know, pay attention a lot to me what's going on at the state level or the federal level. But then you go through this program and then you really learn about, oh, my goodness, like this is why I need to go to this or, you know, this is why I need to be involved in these ways. This is why I need to support my local businesses. And so I think that has a huge impact for the larger community. And then also the ability to network and connect. There have been times when I have had classmates, um, you know, I've reached out to them to help out with certain things or to fulfill certain roles and vice versa. And I think that's great, too. In my opinion, you can never know too many people. So I think that's definitely an added benefit as well. So for someone who's thinking about applying, um, what is the time commitment for this program for someone who has a full-time job? So we will begin in the spring. So, well, January, technically that's not spring, but (laughs) in kind of the- Spring semester, Exactly, yes, yeah. You're you're in higher ed, it's (laughs) spring semester. Yes. So typically we will begin in January and then the program will conclude at the late April or about the first week of May. And we will meet every other week. There is, um, well, again, depending on, how the year is looking. And um, we usually go to Topeka. That's why I'm saying that. And that's usually an overnight. But again, um, we were unable to do that last year due to COVID. But again, we were able to still have a great session with that. But that's normally and it's normally a full day. So we normally start about 815, 830. And then we wrap up at five. And then um, we encourage the class to get together outside of that. Um, There's normally a kickoff dinner to the night before the first session. Because again, just the opportunity to connect and to build relationships is really important too. So how many days of work do you think somebody would miss? Seven. Seven. Uh, So so if you're an employer, um, maybe talk about why an employer should be excited about losing their employee for seven days uh, over a period of five months? I think it's a great opportunity, again, for those employees to talk about the work they do, to showcase their business. Again, when I'd went... um, I had only lived in Manhattan for a couple of years, and so I was able to learn a lot about the different businesses. I also am a lot more aware of what businesses I go to, you know, when I know someone, when I have that personal connection, and also knowing what's local and, you know, what um, maybe a different chain or something. So I think that's a huge opportunity. I think also um, the opportunity for the employees to, again, educate their peers on different issues or challenges that their company or organization may be working on. And then um, the opportunity for that employee to come back with, again, with different skills or new ways of doing things, new ways of trying things out, or really understanding, okay, wow, like it's important that we build relationships with the people we work with. It's important that we see everyone as a leader and everyone having a role and and some of those things that I think are com- that are important and really just help boost the overall morale of no matter of wherever you are. Charlotte, talk a little bit about the history of Leadership Manhattan. How long has the program been in existence? And then maybe how many uh, individuals do you usually select for each class? So actually it began in 1983 and it was called uh, Future Manhattan. And there were, mm, I think there were 10 classes um, that started that. And at a certain point, they decided that we would pause on Manhattan and we wanted to look regionally. And so um, the Flint Hills Regional Leadership was created. And then there was a break until 2002. So, and they said, you know, while that is important, and we support that, we have, and, and the Flint Hills Leadership class is, is a terrific program as well. 
but they said, you know, we have some issues we want to talk about here in Manhattan. So we want to be able to focus on some of the things that just pertain to Manhattan. Our current board chair is a is an alumni, our incoming board chair, our outgoing board chair. Um, a lot of a lot of the leaders of, of the chamber were alumni of the program, which I think is says a lot about about the program itself. Each class is comprised between 16 and 20 individuals. It's not a large class um, by any means. And partly because it really does, like Kylie indicated, we really hone in on where that person is as a group. Um, and so you get too big and you don't get to make those connections. Um, but it is not unusual that you may not make the class the first time you apply. And so we encourage you to continue to apply um, because it is a smaller class. And I will make take a moment to make a point, which you talked about the Flint Hills uh, Regional uh, Leadership Program. I'm on the board of that. Yep. So we still support that. And it's mm-hmm. a great program. It is much broader in terms of the mm-hmm. subject matter uh, because it is regional and you have people from multiple counties. Uh, it's a great program. In fact, we have a staff person who is going to be going through that program as well. Um, so that is a great opportunity to engage if you are certainly if you're looking more regional, uh, if you want to know more about things specific to Manhattan. I think right. ours is is obviously more Manhattan centered. Um, Kylie, I know you guys had to make some adjustments last year with COVID. Talk a little bit about what you did for the last year. I know that was a little harder on the board in the class, but but everybody got through it and you, you graduated a class last year. Yes, we did. And I think the word of last year was adaptable and flexible, <laughs> which again goes really well when talking about leadership. Everyone was in masks when we were in person, of course, and so um, looked for spaces that were a little bit bigger to allow for us to be able to spread out. We also utilized Zoom, and so that worked well um, if we did have class members or other people that, you know, based on level of comfortability or um, if there was quarantine or something else, we were able to accommodate people in that way. And we would check in, repeat, you know, every session, even a couple days before, how is everyone feeling or still okay to meet in person or do we want to make any adjustments? I think everybody almost bonded more, I think, because there was not a lot that was in person. And so it really gave people an opportunity to get to know each other and to get to see each other, which I think is really valuable. But all in all, I think it was very successful. And I really think our participants got a lot out of it and enjoyed it. And I think especially to Healthcare was something that we had not touched on, honestly, before a lot in the sessions. And so I think, again, people really learned a lot and it was very eye opening to understand. You know, again, you think it's, oh, this person's making the decisions and it is what it is. And then, you know, you start to peel it back and it's like, oh, no, there's a whole committee and you have to think about, well, this decision affects this and affects, you know, this in this way and and all of the many ways. So I think there was a lot of great learning, a lot of understanding and a lot of grace that was given. Um, I agree. It was uh, it was quite a complicated situation, but I think uh, everything turned out great. Charlotte, we give an award every year to a leadership Manhattan alum alumni. Um, talk about that and who our winner was last year. So uh, every year we, like you said, at the graduation, we um, have an award that we give to our distinguished alumni, and it's called the Lyle Butler Distinguished Leadership Award. Uh, when Lyle retired, it was um, the recommendation from the Leisure Manhattan Board to the what we call the big board um, that we renamed that, and they were, were like, absolutely. So, um, and this year we were thrilled to be able to give that to Tom Phillips. And Tom has been a part of Leisure Manhattan, obviously, as a alumni but every year like Kylie said we go to Topeka and he has always been so gracious as have our other state representatives to take time as much as they can to come and be with the class um, walk them through some of those questions and answers and really spend time with them so um, and even this year he mm-hmm. was able to he spent a lot of time with the life in the time of a politician and what that was like and what he had to give up and some of the things that he saw and did as a local politician here in Manhattan as well as a state level um, and I um, I'll just echo kind of what Kylie said a little bit about learning a little bit differently this year. Our Topeka Day was totally on Zoom. Um, we Zoomed Topeka in, if you will. And Dick Carter, who always does a terrific job um, leading us in Topeka, continued to do that from afar. Um, but we had some great 
individuals that spent more time with us probably mm-hmm. on a one-on-one level via Zoom than what we see in the Topeka um, when we get together. The only thing they missed out on was the singing um, tour guide of the Capitol. If someone wants to find out about the program, Kali, where do they where do they go? They can look at the chamber website, Manhattan.org. And so that's a great way to look. And then um, we also will post things on social media through the Twitter account. And so that is another great way. Um, ask your employer. Um, and then if you were at like business after hours or any of those kinds of things, that's an opportunity as well to learn more about Leadership Manhattan. All right. Well, Kali, thank you for your leadership. Uh, no pun intended. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, leading the program. And thank you for being with us today on the Think MHK podcast. Thank you for the opportunity. The Think MHK podcast is brought to you by the Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce. Don't forget to subscribe and like the Think MHK podcast on your preferred podcast provider, and you will never risk missing an episode. If you enjoyed our show, please give us a five star rating and leave a review. To find out more about today's topic or other chamber activities, please go to manhattan.org. And now back to today's show. Welcome back to the Think MHK podcast. My co-host for this segment is Sharla Meisenheimer. Hey, Sharla. Hey, Jason. I have a really interesting story about how I met our guest for this segment. Oh, I can't wait to hear. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. So when I moved to town, I lived downtown and I lived above uh, one of the stores downtown and I could walk a half a block to work. Right. And I saw a young lady standing out in front of her store and lightning had struck the top of her store and the, her sign had fallen to the ground. Oh, no. Yeah. And she said, wow, you you live up there. This must have really woken you up last night. I go, it, it actually didn't at all. <laughs> so uh, I felt kind of bad because that had to be a lot of noise for and for me to sleep through. But she got the sign replaced. It looks wonderful. So our guest today is Bobby French with G. Thomas Jewelers. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Jason. Do you, do you remember that day? I do remember that day. I'm sure you do. It was pretty <laughs> traumatic for you, wasn't it? Yes. We had one of those old gas-filled neon signs. So it, it, it actually did explode off the front of the store. Yeah, but it didn't wake yeah. me up. You didn't hear that. Didn't, you didn't. Are a sound sleeper. Sleep well. I was a sound sleeper on that. Good for so, you. <laughs> yeah, but it does. The sound looks great, Thank and you. Uh, you guys did a great job on that. So, tell us a little bit about G. Thomas and how you got started in that business. G. Thomas, we are a small first full service jewelry store, and obviously located in downtown Manhattan. We are the oldest jewelry store in the same location. So we opened up in 1963, and we have never changed locations, done very few upgrades to the building, but we got a new sign because it blew (laughs) off the front. I got started, I actually used to work down the street where Celebrations of the Heart now is at a small store called Name Brand Clothing. My engagement ring had come from uh, G. Thomas and I broke it two weeks before the wedding and kind of had to go into G. Thomas and, you know, I was all freaked out because I broke my ring and didn't know what I was going to do and all of that good stuff. And they they fixed me up. And that's when I first met Dave Thomas. He then offered me a job, which I interviewed for over a period of two years before I got hired. Wow. So I failed like must have been six or seven interviews before I actually got hired. Must not be a good interviewee. (laughs) I doubt doubt that. So how did you go from being the employee to the employer? I was 23 when I started working there. Worked there for 10 years. Minimal responsibilities. Wasn't really shown a lot of the behind the scenes things. But oh, about eight years in, my, my boss started talking about wanting to retire and wanting the manager there at the time to purchase the store who had owned a small business before and said, absolutely no way <laughs> will I uh, buy this business. I don't want to own another business Then it was kind of presented as, well, maybe you and Bobby should buy the store together. And again, it was absolutely no way. (laughs) Not only would I not want to own a business, but with someone, but I I don't want to own a business. So the manager declined. And for about a year, I thought about it and finally decided, "What what the heck? Might as well give it a try. I do love this job. I can do this. I can figure it out. (laughs) And obviously you did figure it out and you do an amazing job. What made you say at the end of that year, like, okay, I can do this. This is, this is who I am and what I want to be. Is spite an option? Yes. (laughs) Okay. So yes. So my, my boss was no offense to anyone over 60 in the room. He was, you know, 65 ish, kind of had that old school mentality. And uh, at the time 
not a lot of women owned small businesses and right. kind of made the comment off the cuff of no female could own this store and run it effectively. So challenge accepted. Exactly. So he threw <laughs> so, the gauntlet and he picked it up and ran with he it. He did. And he maybe, maybe in some secret way he knew that's how I would get over that bump. I don't know. Well, that's he a, just not now. We're still good friends. Well, that's good. And that's <laughs> yeah. an interesting segue into one of our questions for you is that you were, you were a finalist for this year's Women and Minority Owned Business Award at our annual luncheon. So talk about uh, what how you felt when you found out you were one of the three finalists for that. Um, I was surprised, naturally, um, proud and grateful. thought it was neat that someone thought that our business was doing good things in the community. You were not able to attend it was not. that day, right? And so you and I had a conversation about that. Um, so my daughter ended up with COVID. She's All much good. better now. Yeah. We did fine with that. So we had to uh, quarantine for a week. When I emailed yeah. you, I kind of said I had to make the choice of one or the other. And You're like, as a woman in business, isn't it ironic that I have to choose my family or go to or, or work, right? And, yeah. and I know that you're active in our Women in Business program. Mm -hmm. And I'm making an assumption, total assumption on my part. That's probably why, right? You've had individuals that have said, you know, you can't do this. And you want to make sure it's a little easier for the next woman coming up, maybe? Or maybe prove a point that it can be done. It's not necessarily the easiest way to do it, but right. it can be done. This is because I brought my kids to the Women in Business Luncheon. <laughs> no, I thought it was perfect. But actually, and, they enjoyed it. They did. They and your lot, oldest so. had a lot of great comments to say about that, too. About the day, And she's involved in hype. Mm -hmm. What was her viewpoint of that? She essentially made some comments that it was very nice to attend a function where she could learn about adulting without someone trying to sell her something. She found that very refreshing. Yes. And, and you've referenced your family and your husband a few times. So your your husband is one of our great first responders. Yes, he's yeah. a lieutenant at the police department. Yeah, and does a great job, and we appreciate his service mm -hmm. to the community. What is the number one satisfaction that you get from owning your own business? I like the ability to make an impact on our community, on people I work with. Kind of nice to show up for work and to make the rules. If we uh, need to adjust our hours because... We either don't have enough staffing or we can't keep up with the workload. We have the ability to do that. We don't answer to corporate anything, which is nice sometimes. And we get to set the tone. So we can we can rewrite policies if we need to. If something's not working, we have the, uh, it's, it's an easier ability to change the way we do things. So, so one of the things that sold me on moving to Manhattan was the vibrancy of downtown and you are obviously a big part of downtown. Um, what are some things that you you've over the years have seen downtown change with revitalization? Tell me what your thoughts are about how downtown has changed in your time in working and owning a business downtown. The downtown has changed a bit. Um, I've kind of been one of the business owners that kind of stands back and wants what's best for everyone in general, which a lot of the downtown business owners are like. What makes Manhattan a good place for entrepreneurs and local business owners? Definitely the diversity, military, students, and uh, the locals. It's not too big and it's not too small. You're part of the class of 2021, Leadership Manhattan. I am. What What made you want to be a part of that and what surprised you that? I wanted to learn more about our community, how it works, who's who's in charge of what, who to go to when you want to get things done, really. The most surprising thing about that class, I did not realize how much the chamber does for Manhattan and um, the surrounding communities. I didn't know how much they collaborate with outside entities to do the best for us and the surrounding communities. I didn't realize that was such a big part of the chamber and what they do. You have talked a lot about the community and how that's important to you. And you've done a lot, especially during COVID, to give back to your community. You have been very involved with the blessing boxes that are part of our community. Um, I just, I love the um, the concept of leave what you can, take what you need. I think that's a great life lesson in general. Entire community lived by one rule. I think in that were that rule. I think we'd be doing great. You have been a part of the chamber for quite some time now. What has made you either join the chamber, what made you join, or what made you stay with us at the chamber? wasn't entirely sure 
again, what the chamber right. did for the community and um, how it worked. Quite honestly, Karen Hibbard, she's the reason I joined. <laughs> um, she's amazing. She is amazing. And she's downtown a lot. And she stops in the stores and she stops in one day and just says, hey, I really, really think you should join the chamber. And it's a good thing. And I think it would help you in your venture of being a new business owner. When Karen, Karen says do something, you should do it. We agree 100%. <laughs> that's, that's how we operate at the chamber most of the time. So actually, totally our motto. I've actually known Karen since I was five. Bobby, are you from Manhattan originally? I grew up in Wamego. Yes. So have you left the Manhattan area? Been in the Manhattan area since I was four. Talk about being somebody who has, is from the area and, and, and what that means in terms of giving back. This area is my home, has been my home for the majority of my life, I do get to travel some. Um, that's one of the benefits of owning a small business. And uh, I've seen other communities that are just, they're not this clean. They're not this well-maintained. They're not that, they're not as safe as we are here. So obviously being married to law enforcement, I know a lot of statistics about crime per capita, et cetera. And Manhattan's just a really, really great place to be. What advice do you have to individuals who might be thinking about starting up their own business or buying a business? If yeah. you're going to do it, this is the place to be, Manhattan. So, yeah. That's very impressive that you started a, a second enterprise during COVID. Yeah, that was kind of a forced hand. But to recognize that we had jewelers and I've had a small amount of training and to get behind the bench and start making some stuff was another way of really just trying to tolerate a, a situation that I had no idea how to maintain or so we did start an online store of nothing but custom pieces and all handmade in MHK. Bobby, are you ready for your rapid fire questions? Mm -hmm. What is something people often find surprising about you? Pre-COVID, about eight months before COVID hit, I joined a roller derby team in Junction City. Right? See all your surprises? <laughs> at the at the young age of 44. And then it got kind of shut down because of COVID. So, and now I'm maybe a little too afraid to go back. I don't know how I feel about broken bones and stuff. So, <laughs> uh, of all the people that have answered this question, that is the most surprising <laughs> yes. of the things so, I have learned about people. Right? So, uh, it, this is kind of a funny side story. My daughter got married at the um, Catholic Church in Ogden because that's where her grandparents were married. And there's a very small, hole in the wall bar in Ogden, Kansas. And we, when we went over, just my now son-in-law, my daughter and I went over to uh, look at the church to figure out flowers and all that good stuff. We stopped in that little bar and we sat down and I look over and I'm on the poster on the wall with the stroller derby <laughs> team. <laughs> I'm pretty sure my son-in-law was like, oh, no. I, like, I'm pretty sure he wanted to run. But he didn't. He stayed. Yeah, yeah. We're going to have to find that, that person. And they you, actually, awesome. they gave me a marker and they're like, you should sign it. I'm like, oh, OK. So I did. <laughs> so what are you currently reading or your favorite book? I'm currently reading High Performance Habits by Brendan Burchard. What are three things you can't live without? Mm, wine, sarcasm, and purpose. Best piece of advice you have ever received? Don't self-reject. What is something you would like to try but haven't had the opportunity? Skydiving. What three <laughs> words describe living in Manhattan? Mm, clean, eclectic, vibrant. Good words. What TV sitcom family would you want to be part of? I'm a huge Arrested Development fan. Do you know the Bluth family? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, I feel like that's my spirit animal. Okay. <laughs> Samsung, Apple, or other? Apple. Okay. Favorite meal? Chicken wings. <laughs> All right. First and favorite concert? First and favorite? Can they be different? They can be different. Okay. My first concert was Aerosmith, and my favorite concert is Pink. Nice. Uh, okay. I've seen her six times. All right. Really? That's... Oh, she puts on a great show. I bet she's she amazing. Does. Yeah. All right. Talk about well, a strong woman. She's incredible. Bobby, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank we appreciate you. you taking time. We appreciate you being part of the chamber. And congratulations again for being a finalist for the Woman and Minority Owned Business. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think MHK, a podcast produced by the Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce. If you enjoyed the Think MHK podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe and share it out on your social media channels. Feel free to reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, 
or Instagram at the Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you.